Hey everyone, today we're doing a teardown of the new Valve Steam Deck. We already have a full hardware review on the channel. It's got crazy depth, so you should go check it out if you haven't. We did everything from Schlieren imaging to the more expected thermals with some CFD diagrams in there as well. So our testing looks at the power, the battery life, the charging duration, the noise levels, the thermals, the uh, airflow density gradient change out of the back of the Steam Deck, and plenty more. Check that out, linked in the description below. But now we're going to take this apart, uh, at least for camera. We've already taken it apart for wiring up all the thermocouples, but this is a different unit. We're planning to show you some of the component level stuff and get under the motherboard as well, which we haven't shown publicly yet. Uh, so hopefully provide some additional context to how Valve designed this and go through some of the details of things like the MOSFET VRM components, the voltage controller, and a couple other aspects of the design. Before that, this video is brought to you by EVGA's X570 Dark motherboard. The EVGA X570 Dark is a high-end motherboard for AM4 CPUs, built around extreme overclocking and tested heavily by EVGA's Kingpin. The X570 Dark has a uniquely rotated socket and RAM layout, 90-degree rotated cables for ease of installation and management, and tons of troubleshooting features to make building, testing, and overclocking easier. Check out EVGA's X570 Dark high-end motherboard at the link in the description below. Okay, so we're going to start with a walk around of the Steam Deck and look at the chassis design and some of the things like ventilation ports, how the thermals are designed. I'm not going to do the full detailed overview of this because we already did that. It's in our first video. We'll link it below and we'll timestamp it. You could just jump straight there and get the full detail uh, where, for example, we'll explain this computational fluid dynamics diagram and some of the airflow patterns that the Steam Deck is trying to achieve and then how well it thermally achieves them at sort of uh, a practical level or pragmatic level measuring the devices. So anyway, the Steam Deck is designed very specifically, obviously, one, for ergonomics, which we're not going to be talking about today, not evaluating here, and then two, is for reducing the form factor as much as possible and keeping the ability to cool things like the key components. So before we really get started on the teardown, just quick sort of reference point comparison. That's the Steam Deck. Uh, the original Switch is that one. So that's the Nintendo Switch. And then the newer Switch OLED model is this one. This actually Austin Evans shipped to us. Thank you, Austin. We weren't able to get one earlier. Um, and it even came with one of his fingerprints on the screen so that I can log into his phone now. So that's the size comparison. The screen's a little bit different on these. Uh, that was a little different, but otherwise you kind of get the idea. The Steam Deck is a fairly large device. We'll talk about the ergonomics of it separately and in the future, but we did want to at least just sort of give everyone perspective what we're working on today. Let's go ahead and just take it apart. It seems straightforward enough. We are going to be working on the GN Volt Mod Mat today. This is our large Mod Mat. They're in stock and shipping now. We sell through these really fast and all the time. It's got two anti-static grounding straps on it, and it's actually a validated anti-static conductive surface. So that's right. This is one we've tested. It's not just marketing BS like is sadly on a lot of the mats that are on the market where they're basically mouse pads with a grounding strap on them. A mouse pad's an insulator. That doesn't do anything. It's terrible that they do that, but uh, that's what they do. So this is a grounded work surface. We're actually going to be really careful here with the Steam Decks because I still need to do a lot of work on them. They're pre-production units. We're not going to be able to get more. So I don't want to kill it from a stupid reason. That's why we're working on this surface. And you can grab one on store.gamersnexus.net. They are in stock and shipping. They have screw tracking diagrams, the grid, and they've got pinout diagrams for cabling if you do work on computers as well. Also a great way to support us. Okay, let's get started. There's two types of screws in the back. There are eight total screws. And as stated, this is pre-production, but it represents the final sample. So uh, this is what you'll see on yours. Is that these four outer screws are much larger. They have the more coarse thread that's meant for plastic. And you'll see that. Let's get a comparison of these two. So we pan over here to the grid. I'll set them up. God damn it. Okay. Mother. Okay. I was able to get the screws to stand up. That was the hardest part so far. Uh, I don't know how well you can see it. This one's a coarser thread, the longer screw, and that goes into the plastic. So if you're taking this out, putting it back in, just be aware that you'll destroy the threads it creates if you do it wrong. Don't. You can make any screw fit in these holes, but uh, you're going to have different holes at the end of it if, they, if you force those in. So it's just two more. Last screw. This is a battery-operated device. That means the very first step is we need to disconnect the battery because uh, it'll still have a charge. 
And if I were to drag this screwdriver across components in there, drag it across two legs of an integrated circuit or MOSFET or something, it's always a chance that you short things and, um, and potentially cause a death because there is power running through the device, even if it's just like five volt standby or something like that. So now we can take the chassis off. The way I've been doing this, uh, I haven't gotten too many scratches on it. I've gotten a couple, but I've been using one of these pry tools and I go at the trigger edge where there's a little more of an entry point. I just start to loosen it a little bit, like kind of pry back and forth like that. I get this, which is just like a guitar pick basically, and kind of pop out all of the plastic snaps. So Valve's done a pretty good job of making this easy to take apart. I like to leave one in there while the other one is working so that the clips don't push their way back in. At this point, it's basically ready to pull apart. All right. Okay, so with everything taken apart, I'll walk you through some of the design basics. Again, full overview of the thermal design is in the other video, but we'll briefly cover it here. First of all, this is that grill that you saw on the back. It goes like this. The blackout you see there, that black tape is on top of the stainless, this is a stainless steel shield can. The only purpose of this black tape is cosmetic. It is purely and 100% cosmetic, does nothing else at all. So it's just to make the colors match. So that's the primary inlet uh, it doesn't look like much, and the fan's not behind it, but that is in fact intentional. And if you were to take thermal imaging of something like this, the area that would be hot would be the area you'd expect to be hot, which would be the copper, so the fin stack and the, coal, the heat pipe up here, and then to some extent the stainless shield can where there's some components sinking into this. That's why the thermal imaging, we just wired up thermal couples directly because if you do thermography of this, you're basically just showing that heat sinks get hot, which is working as intended. So for the back, this tape is for EMI or, or RFI, so elect electromagnetic or radio frequency interference. That's all that's there for. The other side of it is a foil. Very common for this type of small device to use. A lot of phones use them too. Paddles are just plastic springs. So you can see that slight actuation there from pushing it. There's no magic here. There's no metal spring, unlike these triggers. Around these, you can see the metal spring up in there. So. Uh, the paddles don't have that. And all the paddles do when you push them, see that actuation there? All that does is push this button right here, which this is kind of like a standard type of switch you would use for an input device. Before I go further and explain the rest of this, I want to disconnect the battery so that we don't have any risk of shorting something out while I'm uh, pointing at things. So to get to the battery, you remove two additional screws from the shield can, which go into the, through the PCB and into, a, I believe, a subframe or a magnesium midframe. This foil is just another uh, EMI shield. All right, that can now come off. First thing, disconnect the battery. Battery cable's right here if you ever need it. All right, that's disconnected. Next thing I'm gonna do, is discharge it. So all the cables are connected here. We're going to power on a couple times, push and hold. So battery, sh any capacitance that is in the caps or anywhere else on the board should be depleted at this point. So let's go back a step. This is the shield can. This just goes right on top of the motherboard. So terminology you need to know. Maybe we can have our editors highlight these and name them as we go. The motherboard is this one here. It's got the gold outlining along the edges. We've got a couple daughter boards over here. So specifically, this is for the joystick. That connects to this right here. As soon as we take two screws out, that'll fall through the board and be only connected by a cable. The other joysticks here, Valve has done an awesome thing, which is they've labeled them left and right. So you can't screw it up when you put it back together. To quote Lewis Rossman when he was teaching me some soldering basics, there's nothing you can fuck up that I can't fix. Except, like I said before, I'm not going to fix your device, says the viewer, so don't f*** it up. There's another daughter board down here. That connects to some of the uh, buttons up here. So you got positive and minus for the volume levels. There is a 3.5 millimeter jack. And then, in fact, this cable is an audio cable. You can see it hooking in down here and running down the battery back into the motherboard underside. We need to look at the motherboard underside still. Uh, so that covers the sort of the control boards. And the fan is approximately a... 30, 40 millimeter fan. It is a squirrel cage fan. So uh, this is known as a blower. And the way this works 
is it, it takes air in at the inlet. There's actually a hole on the other side as well. So you get some air access in here. The air gets spit out this way up at the top. Pull a CFD diagram. So oriented the same way. What you're looking at is exhaust coming out the top here. Air comes in through the grate right there over the shield can and flows both over under the motherboard. From You get some from the other side too and uh, across the memory and across the VRM components, things like that. So core components then. The SOC is located here. There's going to be a substrate and then the silicon underneath uh, the heat pipe and this sort of bracket or bracing plate, part of the cold blade. The cold blade underside is made of copper. So it's a copper cold plate, copper heat pipe. This is approximately it's nine millimeters, but most marketing would call that either eight or 10. You can guess which direction marketing typically goes. Uh, is a flat heat pipe, very flat. These flatter heat pipes, the interesting thing with these is that they're actually less efficient than the round heat pipes, but they get more surface area contact if you use it, which Valve is using here. It's going to cover most of the die. And then they also are obviously more compact, so they're used for that reason. Uh, I haven't cut this open to check. I'm assuming this is a sintered copper powder heat pipe, and the way these work is uh, they have an evaporator end here where the little tiny bit of liquid that's inside of these heat pipes, if you didn't know, there is liquid in them, it will evaporate at the heat source and rise as a gas over to the condenser, the cold end over here, where you can see it's in the fan output and connected to the fin stack, uh, at which point it recondenses as a liquid. It uses capillary action to flow down the sintered copper powder and comes back down to repeat the process. And that phase change is what gets most of your cooling done. That's why. Now, anything with a heat pipe is generally very efficient. Not that Valve, Valve did not invent these, to be clear, but that's how it works. Components, we'll give more detail on these in a little bit, but there are three FETs uh, that are our main concern here. So we've got MOSFETs 1, 2, 3 right there. Their inductors are here. This was the hotspot one that we measured. Uh, we called it MOSFET 11 in our testing, and that's about the hottest one that we could find out of the devices on the the voltage regulator module. The reason it's hot is because it's in between more VRM components, so it's got really hot con uh, inductors here. Inductors are just copper coil with a shell. So you got two of those, you got another MOSFET, another inductor, another inductor. That's a really hot spot on the board. So Steve asked me to talk about the power components to you guys, and the first thing we're going to look at is this little charging IC right here. Uh, this particular thing is what charges or controls the charging of the battery from the input from the charging adapter. And then we're also going to talk about this VRM, the voltage regulator module. This is what takes the DC input and steps it down from 12 volts to a more usable like 1 volt or less uh, for the CPU. Um, and in this case, the VRM has four parts, uh, number one being the controller, number two being the MOSFETs, which is these little black things we're going to get to in just a minute, and uh, then the inductors, which is these little gray boxes, and there's some capacitors involved as well. So those are the four parts. Um, this would be a spot where it would be very easy to cheap out on the uh, components, and especially because uh, for the most part, nobody's going to be taking the back of this thing off, and it would be easy to have this covered up and no one ever see whether or not the quality was any good. Uh, in our testing, though, these parts all were well within spec, the manufacturer spec. Uh, the manufacturer spec was something like 105 degrees C, and these these little MOSFETs never got above 70. So um, the the component choice here was definitely adequate for what's going on. So let's get uh, a little bit of microscope view of what's going on. I'll show you guys the charging IC first. This particular IC is a uh, Maxim integration uh, IC, and you can see it's got a bunch of feet around it there and the, the part number is a 77961. Uh, that's the charging IC. And then as we move away from the charging IC, we're going to go up and to the left a little bit, closer to the CPU. Uh, this is the controller right here. And then if we zoom out a little bit, we can see that this is a, an MP2845. Uh, and then the MP2845 is controlling three uh, DR MOS chips. And we'll talk about what that means in a little bit as well. But uh, let me get a little bit cleaner picture there. So this is uh, also MP chip, and <laughs> this is a little bit, little bit uh, greased out here from the thermal pads. That's an 86902, and then uh, 86902B, I should point out. And then to the right of that is an 86902B as well. And then if we go to the left here, this is the third and final of these MOSFETs. That's a uh, MP86903C. We'll take a closer look at what all this stuff's supposed to do in just a moment. 
all four of the VRM ICs are from a company called Monolithic Power Systems. That's this little MPS down here. And we dug up one of their PDFs, and it actually referenced, as you can see here, Intel Tiger Lake designs and some AMD designs that are using the exact same power ICs for the VRMs uh, as the Valve Steam Deck is. In particular, what we're getting a good look at is this 86902B. You can see that right over here. It's a 3 millimeter by 4 millimeter package, and it's got, um, I think, 21 pins. And the 21 pin out pins here match exactly the 21 pins here. And this even gives us a good look at what, what the current capabilities are. This is like a scale 12 amp, 25, and 50 for all of their different ICs. But in particular, we're focusing on this one. And you can see that it can take in 3 to 12 volts and output 35 amps. We'll get more specs on that chip as we go along here. So the other part of the VRM that we're not seeing here is the controller. So if I just glance over a little bit here, We'll enlarge that. That was, as we mentioned, an MP2845. The MP2845 is a controller, and if I scroll up in this document here, you can see the way this is built. It's got a controller here. This is an MP2945, but you can see the 2845 referenced here, and then it controls those MOSFETs, which are these IntelliFase chips over here. The MP2845 uh, is a six-phase, four-rail chip, and in this particular setup, it's doing one phase per rail, three rails with one phase per rail. And each of the three phases are shown here in this first image we've got, one for the SOC, one for the graphics, and one for the CPU that's itself. And in, this, in our testing, the CPU is the piece that got the hottest, and it went to about 70C, and what the manufacturer spec is is 105C. So like I said a moment ago, this is all uh, well within manufacturer spec. We looked up the specs for these three VRMICs, and the A6903C can pull in somewhere between 4.5 volts and 22 volts, and it can output 30 amps on one of them, on one of these old chips. The 86902B, which we have two of those, can pull in between 3.3 and 12 volts, uh, which is, again, a lower voltage than this, but it outputs actually more current at 35 amps. And that actually, tr that, that tracks uh, according to what we saw in our research, because the CPU got the hottest, and generally speaking, the IC that gets the hottest is the one that's running at the highest frequencies and um, pulling through the most current. Uh, in, in this case, if we look at the 86902, it, uh, it can actually go up to, to 2 megahertz as opposed to 1.2 megahertz, so it could actually run at a higher frequency. We don't know exactly what frequency it's running at, uh, and it can actually pull more current, 35 amps as opposed to 30 amps. All right, so you've heard me refer to these things as DRMOS ICs or DRMOS uh, chips. The, the DRMOS is just an abbreviation for driver MOSFET all-in-one package. We pulled up an image here that kind of explains this from a circuit diagram look. Uh, all this stuff over here is the driver for the MOSFETs. So each one of these little packages has these three elements inside of it. The driver circuit plus two independent MOSFETs. Uh, independent is probably not the right word, uh, maybe asymmetric is a better word there, but basically one of these is called a high side FET and the other one's called a low side FET, that says HS and LS. And that's what makes up a driver MOSFET package. Now the whole point of the VRM, as we mentioned earlier, was to take the, the voltage from a higher level to a lower level, again let's say 12 volts to maybe 1.2 volts. And what, the way that's done, the, the, the circuit design, using these MOSFETs, this control, and the inductor that we showed earlier in the video is through a, a design called a buck converter. And the buck converter uh, takes the voltage and steps it down. So if you're hearing any of this te terminology in other uh, power design talk, uh, you, can, you can now have a better idea of what it is. So buck converter, VRM, kind of the same thing in the ideology. That brings us to the last piece of the power circuitry, which is what we actually opened up with at the microscope, and that's the Maxim Integrated 77961, this little guy right here. Uh, it's got a lot of feet on it, does a lot of stuff. We actually got a diagram for you over here. This is the product page for it, the Max 77961. It's just a few things, for instance, that it can take in 25 volts maximum, and that it can charge at six amps. So uh, this is a piece that if you had this thing open, you would definitely not want it plugged in while it was open because that charging circuit can output six amps. And current at six amps is, is not great to feel. Um, so uh, A, 
probably don't work on electronics unless you know what you're doing. And B, be careful with charging circuits. There you go. Um, anyway, and in, in going into the charging circuit more, this one can support two or three lithium ion cells. And um, it, the chemistry in the batteries can be lithium ion or lithium polymer. What's interesting here is that the temperature rating on the documentation says that it goes up to a max of 85C. But according to Valve's documentation that they gave us, they said that this, the IC could support up to 105C. So it's possible that Valve got a specially, specially designed version of this chip that supports 105C. And uh, the reason that this is somewhat interesting for us is because in our testing, when we had the heat sink, uh, or that's called the heat shield on this chip, it actually got, as, as if you go look at our first video, it actually got up to about 90 degrees Celsius. And then when we pulled that off, it got even hotter. So if 85C was the max for this chip, then we exceeded that. But uh, like, we, like I said, according to Valve, uh, it can go up to 105C. So that wraps up all the power circuitry in the Steam Deck, and I'm gonna throw it now back over to Steve so he can continue with the teardown. Okay, so we've teleported and swapped out Steam Decks here. I had to give Patrick his back for testing more gaming applications, and the one I've been working on is the Frankenstein one for thermal testing. I couldn't disassemble this further in the initial review because I didn't want to tamper with the thermal paste used under the cold plate. As for the thermocouples you see here, we took a industry standard approach to wiring up thermocouples. Valve actually uses the same process uh, our thermocouples plus the special bonding solution we use are about 190 microns thick, so very thin. They don't really meaningfully influence the results. That's why we use them the way we do. This is the best way to get measurements. So let's take apart the, uh, the actual cooling assembly for the SOC. I really want to see what's under here. Okay, for this over here, this is just an adhesive with some of the serial numbers and things on it. That gap really needs to not exist because valve needs to make sure that air is going through the fin stack and not escaping before it ever hits it. So in talking with valve's engineers directly, we learned that this was the solution where uh, this is actually fairly standard too, especially in laptops, things like that, where they are just using a piece of tape to guide the flow, which is perfectly adequate. So anyway, that's important. If you ever take it apart, don't lose that. That's not just serial numbers you can throw away. Uh, you will need that. Here's the fin stack. That is a hell of a thermal paste spread. So this, to my knowledge, has been taken apart by a valve engineer before it got to us, which means that I'm thinking the thermal paste spread we're seeing here is, is not probably representative of what the end product will be, but we'll see. The, the end product may be done by machine. They might also silk screen it, I'm not sure. If it's low volume, they'll silk screen it, like uh, Cooler Master did when we showed our AMD stock heat sink manufacturing factory tour, which you should definitely check out. This is an AL1050 uh, alloy. So AL1050 is particularly useful because you still get some thermal conductivity. It's about 257 watts per meter Kelvin at 25 degrees Celsius measurement temperature for the ambient. And um, still good thermal conductivity. For perspective, copper is about 405. There's a lot more to it than that, but that's the quick numbers for you. And AL1050 is also useful because it's fairly rigid. So structurally it's useful. You can see here uh, they've used it for the screw mounting. And then it's also corrosion resistant or more corrosion resistant than some other materials. You can see there's a thermal pad on top of it, which is actually sinking into the stainless steel can. So there's a little bit of shared capacity there, um, but pretty simple design. Underside, we've got an exposed bit of copper there. Let's go ahead and clean this. There you go, just a copper contact patch. I'm gonna do some pressure testing and flatness testing on this. We'll have it in a separate video, so check back for that. Same methodology we use for our cooler reviews where we're gonna use a, a special chemically reactive paper for some of it. And actually down here, if you look even further down, really good attention to detail on valve. I'm, I'm pretty impressed with this, honestly, especially for a technically pre-production. That thing in there, that's another damper. This is maybe a piece of foam and some tape to help with reducing rattle and uh, also probably positioning it on the Z-axis the right place. Okay, so let's talk about the thermal paste spread here. Some people are gonna comment about this. Uh, having too much thermal paste isn't really a thing. We've tested that comment, not really true. There is obviously an absolute extreme where it becomes true, but thermal paste will just squish out. And that's what you're seeing here. Uh, the, I, the SOC here is actually branded, which is kind of neat. It's got, uh, this is a, a AMD product, TSMC made. It's a disconnect a bunch of cables and I wanna pull the motherboard out here. This is the motherboard cable. We'll see where that connects in a moment maybe to the display. The display's underneath. There's a cable here, 
that connects, this is data, this connects the joystick, which was here, to the controller board underneath, which is used for input of the triggers and some of the other devices on the other side of the screen, plus these paddles. And then over on this side, same thing. Then this control board, you can follow the cables, goes down this way and connects back to the motherboard, as does this one. You can see it goes from the motherboard underside here over to the control board here, and that's how they talk to each other. This is where uh, your SSD and your Wi-Fi module will go. So we'll look at those as we kind of take it apart. There's EMI or RFI shielding there as well. So for the wireless antenna, you can see the black and white lines running right here from the wireless card underneath, and those get soldered in at this spot. So that's where your antenna are situated. Oh, nice. They've labeled it. I love it. These are just foam, and it's just to stop that shield can from scratching up the PCB. I mean, I'm impressed so far. Just you know, It's stuff like that. It's small attention to detail. That's always what we look for and what impresses us when companies, um, I don't know, give a sh I'm impressed with how easy this is to disassemble. So here's the back side underneath the motherboard. This is, in fact, the display cable. That's what we suspected earlier. That goes to the display. We've now revealed what I'd probably call the midframe. That's this structure right here. So everything from that point and that point coming over to the right, you can see the, the terminating point right here. That's going to be the midframe, mostly responsible for rigidity. So the SOC is right on the opposite side of this. You got the standard, uh, looks like MLCC is on the back of that. A bunch of MLCCs in here. So the two places where you're going to have board flex from the user plugging in a charging cable right here and causing the board to slightly wiggle up and down, which eventually you know, enough connection cycles starts killing things. And down here where there's an SD card reader, both of those are damped, so that's cool. Good, again, um, you know, Valve for being relatively new to the hardware game in a, in a real capacity is doing a good job. So if you were going to remove the battery and do a like-for-like -like replacement, you would pull these cables off very carefully and then re-glue them to the new one. You know, Valve, if you're watching, I want you to know that this is the first time in a while I've actually tried to um, cause zero damage to <laughs> something. I'm so happy we finally have a use for this Sharpie. If you want to buy signed mod mats or toolkits, by the way, we sell them on store.gamersnexus.net. I use silver, though. So we have about a 1,000 of these because they come in forced packs. <laughs> Manufacturing information. It was made in 2021. November is what's punched over here. And uh, our model happens to be number 11 out of 290 from the initial pre-production run. So if you've been wondering how long they've been making it, <laughs> if, you, if you wonder why, they, well, hey, why did Valve push back the December launch? The answer is that this one was made in November. That's why. Problem solved. Nice. Okay, there's one of the daughter boards controlling some of the input. This has an Atmel controller on it. ATS AMD 21J18. This board is for the trackpad on the other side. That pad right there is communicating with this board. There's the trackpad or, uh, PCB. You actually see some of the contact, the traces in there. This actually to me looks more like it's just for support and for some of that force feedback haptics you feel on the trackpad, I don't think that's doing too much thermally on this side. I don't think it's doing anything thermally on this side. So I do think the magnesium midframe is, is going to provide some of the heat spreading capability. It doesn't have any dissipation access, but uh, it'll still spread until saturation. I like this. These cables are labeled as well. So this is the D-pad, and this one is labeled Action which is just going to be the four buttons. That is a speaker right there. That's the box holding the speaker. And then this is the other speaker right here. So 
So there's your action buttons with the somewhat standard carbon contacts or electrical contacts with this carbon filter here. So that's how the buttons are connected. This is fairly standard, really. You can see the plastic pieces in here. OK, so we've completed the teardown. We switched sets to lay it all out for some nice B-roll. This is the last piece. Uh, we decided to leave the magnesium midframe in the chassis because at this point, we would really be tampering with the way the screen is adhered or connected to the midframe. And because I still have a lot more thermal testing to do, I'm a little bit worried about influencing the results too much if there's any thermal adhesive in there. Also worried about just potentially causing damage. Screens are pretty sensitive. And uh, so we're going to stop there. But that's basically 99% disassembled at this point. The battery, at least on ours, appears to be glued in. I'm really disappointed in that. This should just be pretty close to a socketable replacement to ensure the most uh, longevity for users. Batteries are the most common thing to get replaced when they are able to be replaced because the most common thing that at some point starts to fall below a, an acceptable level for the user. So that's really unfortunate. Probably it has something to do with liability, but that's, I don't know. But I'll just tell them that this like YouTube channel said you should do a replaceable one and then they'll sue us and I'll leave the country. So, um, so that's, that's the biggest thing I was disappointed about. Overall, things are fairly easy to get to. It's a little bit of a nightmare in terms of the screws. They're all over the place, uh, but they mostly use the same types of screws. It's just there's three or four kinds. Make sure you track them really carefully, and you'll be fine if you take it apart. Would not recommend taking it apart to this level. The joysticks are pretty interesting, but they have these tiny wires attached to them. So if replacing the joystick, you'd probably want to do the entire module with the PCB uh, and not just the cap, for example. Otherwise, you would lose the capacitive touch on top of it. But other than that, everything's fairly standard to get to. Now, the next most common component to maybe die is probably the fan. The fan was a colossal pain in the ass to find online. It's not a part number that's listed anywhere right now. It seems like Valve maybe has a customized version of an existing laptop fan that's been uh, retooled to fit inside a chassis for the Steam Deck. So I asked Mike, our cooler technician on our team, and Patrick Lathan, who did all the games testing for the Steam Deck, to try and find it for me. Their solution was really clever. So uh, first of all, they were able to eventually find, through scrolling through listings, laptop fans that had the same logo, identified that the, this particular brand is common in Del Vostro products, and then Patrick went and pulled up a specific listing from the TUV, uh, and that listing, it's a certification filing, uh, and that listing is where we were able to identify the brand. So all of that, to say, we probably could have just asked Valve, but this was more fun. So the fan is a 5 volt, 0.5 amp fan. If you ever need to replace it, uh, the model is BN5010S5H-N00P. Eventually, it'll probably be online. And the company is Huayin Dianzi Gongsi, and it's in, uh, in Sichuan in China. So. I don't know, it's a, it's a customized fan, I think, so you'll probably have to wait for some Steam Deck for parts to pop up. But anyway, that's the part. A couple more final notes. The joysticks are Alps. It's very common, and again, they're capacitive. In terms of SSDs, we'll talk about that more later once we get the other ones in stock. There's the 64 gigabyte, 256, and 512. The 64 gigabyte model in particular has a lower end EMMC PCIe Gen 2 by 1 SSD, but again, that'll come up later. So that's it then. Overall, it's easy to access and fairly easy to take apart completely. Some of the stuff is a little more difficult to replace than we'd like. Some of that's just because it's not formally out yet, so third parties haven't shipped things yet. But uh, overall, it's a good start. Now we just need to reassemble this with some modifications for our next round of thermal testing. So check back for that. Make sure you're subscribed. We have a lot more coming with the Steam Deck over the next couple of weeks. At this point, it'll probably be uh, spaced out a few days between the content and our normal PC review content. So as always, thank you for watching. You can go to store.gamersaccess.net to grab one of our coasters on back order. They're finally coming back. They sold through crazy fast last time, so make sure you get them. It also supports us. And uh, check our first video if you haven't seen it already. Thanks for watching. We'll see you all next time.